So, so the weapons are still in, in place. America's got 2,500 on hair trigger alert, and Russia's got 2,500. And because, oh, let me walk you through how America will fight and win a nuclear war. You knock out their eyes and ears, which are the satellites with infrared detectors which pick up the flame from the missiles. You knock out the command center in Moscow. Then you launch your missiles. You've got over 3,000 hydrogen bombs on your Trident subs at sea at any one time, roving around quietly. And a commander, if he became psychotic and convinced his crew, can launch his missiles without communicating with the Pentagon. And they're only about 15 minutes away from Russia. So you launch them and your Minutemen missiles with three hydrogen bombs in them. The, the Trident missiles have eight hydrogen bombs. It's called Merving, Multiple Independent Reentry Vehicle. And they're so accurate and guided by the GPS satellites that they land right on top of the missile silos and, quotes, kill the missiles. Um, people are disassembled. People are seen as objects, and they don't have any humanity. And millions of people being killed in such an attack is called collateral damage by the Pentagon. Now, the fact then, if you miss a few, and L Russia launches them and gets them up, up, you're setting up a missile defence to shoot them down. And there are various stages of the missile defence: boost phase, transit phase, terminal phase, and the like. I can go into that, but it's all in the book. Um, so, so then you've won the nuclear war. You've killed their missiles. Now, because the Russians don't want their missiles killed and they think like your military do, madmen they are, they would launch their weapons to make sure your missiles hit empty silos. The trouble is a thousand bombs dropping on a hundred cities creates nuclear winter and the end of life on Earth. And we're talking about 5,000 nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert. So, and, and how does nuclear winter occur? The cities burn with a huge cloud of toxic black smoke which roils up and covers the earth so thick with a cloud it blocks out the sun for a year. And we sort of saw this recently in Australia where we had the most ghastly bushfires and the sky in the middle of the day was navy blue and purple, full of smoke. And I said to my friend, this is like nuclear winter. There was no sunlight. Photosynthesis ceases and most of the 30 million species on the planet that cohabit it with us will die, and we will too. And that'll be the end of Shakespeare and Brahms and Mozart and Beethoven and, she and, and the rest, Picasso, Rembrandt. But it's all right because the nuclear war is won. Now, the Russians are suitably paranoid about this policy, as one would be. Uh, and because their satellites now only work eight hours a day, because they're all falling apart, they're decrepit, they can't afford to keep their satellites and early warning system going, they get very jumpy. And it's clinically contraindicated to threaten a paranoid patient because they often do something really dangerous and threaten you, and people who've worked with patients know that. So one day in, in January 1995, Norway launched a missile, an old American missile, with a weather satellite on, on top. Now, the Pentagon had told the Kremlin that was going to happen, but the Kremlin lost the papers. If you've been to Russia, they're a bit hopeless. You're really organized. Bang, 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 bang. Probably the most organized nation in the world, maybe apart from the Germans. But the Russians are sort of hopeless, and they lost the stuff. So the missiles launched, and they pick up the telemetry from the missile and the fire from the missile with the infrared satellite, and they say, oh, my God, we're under attack. That loop takes 15 minutes. The missiles land in 30. So there's Yeltsin, hardened alcoholic, maybe two bottle, bottles of vodka a day, Wernicke's encephalopathy, Korsakoff syndrome. They open the football for the first time in the history of the nuclear age in Russia. Hands up those who don't know what the football is. Oh, well, remember when Reagan was shot? They always carry a case. An aide always carries a case behind the president with the nuclear codes in it, so if necessary, he can press the button and blow up the planet. When Reagan was shot, they lost the football for two days. They didn't know where it was. Remember Alexander Haig said, I'm in charge now? Do you remember that? Well, so here's Yeltsin sitting before the football opened. His general standing over his shoulder, and he had a three-minute time frame to press the button before his missiles could be killed, and he obviously didn't want that to happen. Ten seconds before that time elapsed, the missile veered off course. And we're still here. 
That was written about in a large article in the New York Times, but was covered near the back page. Instead of nine miners, you know, removed from mine in Pennsylvania, front page, big headlines, it was back page. So the media is determining the fate of the earth because no one knows that. But it was well documented in a large New York Times article. Those sort of accidents occur not infrequently in both early warning systems in Russia and America. Once your weapons were nearly set off by a 46 cent computer chip failing, once a flock of geese flying along nearly set off the infrared detector, once a rising moon reflected off the clouds and nearly set off the detector. In fact, a hundred or so events occur each year, some minor, some more serious, in both sets of early warning systems. So you understand that we live under the twirling sword of the nuclear Damocles every second of every day. In the 80s we knew, in the 90s or the year 2003, we don't know. And I really doubt if George Bush understands this. I think Cheney does, because he's been living underground ever since September the 11th. <laughs> Incidentally, you might like to know that there's a huge city in Virginia that's built, been built for the senators and Congress people and the people from the White House. It's got black and white check tiles. It's got a big hospital. And interestingly, um, the senators and congressmen are lot, not allowed to take their wives down there in the event of nuclear war, but they, they can take their secretaries. So I always have a good look at their secretaries when I go into to lobby. Now, let's go back to Iraq. It was mooted by the Pentagon for nine months before they went in or invaded that America might use a nuclear bunker buster. They've got a lovely masculine testosterone name. It's called Robust Earth Penetrator. They used, notice they use that word a lot, robust. It must have some sexual connotation. Maybe these people, if they were given Viagra, wouldn't feel the need to use robust weapons so much. But anyway, I'm just joking. So they were, they were planning to use possibly a small nuclear weapon of about five kilotons. Hiroshima was 13 kilotons to knock out Hussein's underground bunkers. If or if he'd used chemical or biological weapons, they were planning to use a nuclear weapon. Now, if they did, which could be picked up by the infrared detectors in Moscow and misinterpreted like they did with the Norwegian weather satellite that America had launched a first strike. So do you see how tenuous our life is? It's much more tenuous than it was in the 80s because A, we all knew we were under terrible threat and B, we didn't have the people in the White House that we have now and C, the people in the White House might like to use nuclear weapons which could trigger this whole system. What makes me so incredibly frustrated as a physician trying to practice global preventive medicine is that people in America don't, or, or globally, don't know this. Hands up those of you who knew that the weapons are still on first strike, uh, on nuclear alert um, and hair trigger alert and that America has a policy to fight and win a nuclear war. Hands up those of you who knew. Mm, this is a focus group. <laughs> so that, if you look around, that gives you an indication of the danger we're in because if you don't know there's a danger, you won't work to prevent it happening. Now, I'll talk about North Korea in a while because I just heard the news on, on the radio when I was doing the Dennis Bernstein interview, but I want to go back to Iraq. In 1991, when America invaded Iraq, it was a radioactive war. I call it a nuclear war. They used 300 to 800 tonnes of weapons made of what's called depleted uranium. Now, uranium, when you mine it, has two isotopes, 235, which is what you make bombs out of in nuclear reactors, and 238. 235 is present in 0.7%. It must be enriched to 50% for bombs and 3% for nuclear power plants. The rest that's left behind is 238. 238 is 1.7 times more dense than lead. It's free. It's lying around the country, leaking everywhere. It's carcinogenic. They don't want it. So it's great for the military because it makes terrific anti-tank shells. When you launch one, of, they're, they're really anti-tank shells. They're sort of sh small missiles of solid uranium. They're not uranium-tipped. I like the way they say nuclear-tipped for the missiles. They're not tipped. They have hydrogen bombs in them. This is not tipped. And the media goes along with this euphemistic language. 